Let me bring in our think tank tonight, joining us uh, here tonight. Let's take a look. There we go. Okay, we got them all. Mark O'Mara, criminal defense attorney down in Orlando, Florida. Lisa Wells, criminal defense attorney joining us here. Ray Judice, criminal defense attorney. And Eklund Mercy, also here in studio. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, let me start with you, Mark. You're down there in Orlando. Your reaction, first of all, to a wink, a wink towards the victim's family. This is outrageous behavior and not behavior that's going to help Scott Nelson. No, it really is disgusting in, in the sense of that's his first opportunity. Now, to have some impact on the jury. Now, it seems as though the jurors did not see it. But literally, it would take one juror to have seen some movement of the head or something that they perceived, or maybe even a reaction from the people that he was looking towards. And that's the type of information that a juror will take back, even though it's not evidence, didn't come from the witness stand. We all know that that's the type of information that will make impact on a juror and they're going to take it back to the rest of the jury. And just a nuance like that can turn that jury against him. And he did it literally in the opening statement of the prosecution, the very first time the jury was listening to anything about this case. Yeah. Eckler, what does that tell us about this defendant and the way this defendant is going to act? And, and rem let's all remember that this defendant has already written a letter to the judge saying, I'm going to testify. Yeah. Um with regards to this particular defendant, I think he's getting everything that he wants. I think he wants notoriety. Um, according to the record, he even had a commercial in which he was talking about a dentist, a, a, a dental, a dental place or what have you. Right now, uh, Mr. Nelson is getting everything that he wants. He is getting the notoriety. He's getting the publicity. Maybe a couple of years ago, he would get, go into a room and only one person would know his name. Now he's national. So he's making the stage for it, which poses a definite problem to his defense attorneys who probably are just... They've got to be mortified. And, and yeah. they're doing their job and they have to do their job. That's the way our system works. That's the way I have criminal defense attorneys. But, uh, Ray... Um, what are you reading about this guy and who he is yeah, and what's yeah. going to happen during this trial? I think that as Mark, I think, is pointing out, in the initial opportunity that this guy, this defendant has to do something detrimental to his case, but perhaps lay an appellate foundation, okay, and perhaps support his I'm crazy and not competent defense, which we might hear, he took advantage of it. Well, according to what I heard a little earlier today in your show, this trial is going to go probably till late next this week for the guilt or innocent stage. And if he's convicted, although he's presumed innocent, we'll go to the death penalty stage next week. He's got lots of opportunities, despite his good counsel saying, please don't do anything stupid to do something really stupid. And I bet, and I think that's what Mark's hinting at, he will do so. Yeah, this, is, this, this trial, I think, for this defense team is really about trying to save a life, the life of their client. He's not really helping at this point. Well, I mean, at this point, you know, the the defense, you know, the evidence is is going to be overwhelming toward this guy. So really, we're we're, we're working on as a uh, defense team um, whether he gets the death penalty or not, or whether he gets life in prison with parole, without parole. So the the issue here is always going to be mitigation. The defense team is going to be working toward mitigation. A wink is aggravating. That's not mitigating. Well, though. if he's crazy, it's mitigating because if he has if he has a mental disability or he is um, suffering from some sort of mental illness, that would be mitigating. So what what kind of illness makes you arrogant? And narcissistic. Is that, a, is that a mental illness or is that just who he is? That's media. the question. <laughs> and the, and that, that's what the defense is going to have to argue, that he, he's not arrogant, he's not evil, that he's crazy. And that's going to have to be what they go with. And then if you remember, I think the defense said they need four days for mitigation section in the death penalty. They've got something planned. Mm -hmm. they've, got, they've got probably more to submit to the jury in that stage should it happen than they will in the guilt or innocence stage. And I want to put it back up on the screen, uh, the photograph we have from inside the courtroom with the layout, which again is sort of unusual. Mark O'Mara, you're down there. I is this normal down in Central Florida that we're going to have the jury seated on the same side of the defendant and be able to really have a much closer view of the man whose life they may have in their hands at some point? I don't know if Mark heard me. Mark? Mark? Is it normal down in Central Florida to have the... Uh, oh, actually... Go ahead. 
Yeah, the jury, uh, we had to fight, and I've had many arguments with jur judges because they always put the state closest to the jury. And I don't like that because it's just that it literally is that physical closeness can lead to an emotional, intellectual closeness. So I always argue it. We actually argued that in the Zimmerman case, we won it for jury selection, they put us even, and then we lost for trial. So yeah, it is a little bit unique. Normally it is the state in all courtrooms in Florida that I've tried in, they always get the closest to the jury. Uh, and again, it is that closeness that can have that subtle, almost psychological effect on how a jury considers the different parties. All right, our 13th juror question for the folks at home who are not sitting next to the defendant. Who had a better opening statement? Was it the prosecution or defense? Go to our Facebook page or my Facebook page, Vinnie Politan Court TV. Let us know, prosecution or defense. He carjacked her, he robbed her, and lastly, her name was Jennifer Fulford, and he is guilty of her first degree murder. We're a, law, a nation of laws, and we all agree to follow that. Um, so again, the state has to bring that evidence. So how are you going to make that determination? Well, the way you're going to make that determination is by listening to what you hear from this spot right here. Nowhere else are you going to hear any evidence in the case except from right here. And that's where you've got to derive it from. Opening statements today. Two completely different versions of how you do an opening statement and what you put in an opening statement. In one, there were like facts and specific accusations about this case. Names were named. And then you had another one that was kind of a general one, talking about, yeah, you got to follow the law. And I don't know, no names were named, like the defendant's name didn't really come up either during the defense opening statement. Two completely different approaches. It's our 13th year question, by the way, which one was better? Let me bring back in my think tank and begin here in studio. How about not mentioning the defendant's name during the opening statement by the defense? It's a smart move. Um, he, the last time you called his name, the last time the prosecutor called his name, he came and did an outburst. So you're going to have to play D. You're going to have to play recon. You do not, especially when you're dealing with a client that's that volatile, you don't want to, you, you don't ask any questions you don't know the answer to, and you don't answer, you do not poke the bear. So have you ever given an opening statement in a case without using the name of your Client? No, and I'll respectfully disagree. Okay. This is a death penalty case, and I feel that from the moment one, from the voir dire that took almost two weeks, I'm doing everything I can to humanize this guy, my client. He has a name. Uh, maybe you find that he committed a horrific crime. Maybe you'll find that he committed one of the lesser included charges that the jury will be charged. Maybe you won't give him the death penalty, but I want them to see him as a human being not the horrific homicidal maniac that the prosecution wants the jury to find. So I see the point about neutralizing it, and you don't know if you mentioned his name what he might say or do, so I see that point. But I think at the end of the day, in a death penalty case, your job is to save his life and then go backwards from there. So yeah. I, I would work it differently. Were you shocked? Mm, yeah, I mean, I would definitely have said his name. I try to say his first name as often as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to make him real because all you need is one juror, one juror to not give him the death penalty. And that's what they're looking for. They want one to have some sort of sympathy for him. Mark, is there some sort of strategy that I don't know about here in, in, in distancing themselves seemingly during the opening statement? Well, you know, and I know Bob Lahr, he's been with the PD's office for decades. He's a good lawyer. He's done a lot of these cases. But I got to tell you, I, I'm with the majority on this one, and that is... You have to play to your strong suit. The only strong suit that you have in the defense case is not guilt, it is penalty. And you have to get that one juror, one or a couple, who actually look at your, juror, look at your client and say, I'm not gonna kill him. And if you don't set that seed, first of all, it should be well set in jury selection. Um, when you're death qualifying them, when you're talking about pretrial publicity, when you're talking about 
their kids and their job and giving us a lot of their time. You have to be starting those seeds planted at that point. But when you're talking in opening statements, when you're on the record talking about your client, it's got to be my client, Scott. You're going to hear a lot about Scott these days, next few days. You're not going to like a lot of what you hear about Scott. But at some point, I'm going to have an opportunity to present to you the Scott that I've come to know in the past year and a half. Something like that has to come across because you've got to start working at those heartstrings to get, again, at least one of those jurors thinking, I don't have to kill this guy. And um, missing the opportunity to start that humanizing will continue that humanizing during opening, um, I thought was a missing. You know, another big moment uh, today during the day was Robert Fulford's testimony. He is the husband of Jennifer Fulford, the victim in this case. And as I watched his testimony, to me, you want to know the impact that this case had, just look at his eyes. Anything out of the ordinary with her when she left that day? No, no. Sir, did you ever see her again after she left your house that morning? I did not. Did you ever hear from her during the day on September 27th? Uh, no, I did not. No phone calls, text messages, anything like that? Uh, no. Was that unusual for the two of you to kind of not communicate during the day? Uh, no, not usually. We were usually both very busy. Okay. So it didn't give you any cause for concern that you didn't hear from her throughout the day? No. So do both kids live in Texas? Yes. And they're adults? Yes. Do they have children of their own? Uh, Austin, at the time, uh, had one and was expecting one. When was his second baby born? That same day. Austin's child was born on September 27th, 2017? Yes. And when you talked to Austin, had he heard from his mom after his baby was born? No. Think about this moment and think about the impact that all this is going to have on this family forever. Jennifer Fulford's son, new child in the world, his wife giving birth the same day she went missing. She had plans to go to Texas to visit her new grandchild who she never met. Didn't even have an opportunity to speak to her son after the birth of this grandchild. And this is a woman who professionally is a nanny. You know how much she loves kids. Will never be apart. And that anniversary forever will remain the day that Jennifer Fulford died, but also the birth of her grandchild. Um, Lisa, this is a part of this case. And you know, you might look at it as a small fact, huge impact makes makes Jennifer Fulford we understand she's real and we understand the impact that all of this has on that family now yeah it's just heartbreaking just that that day that she'll never ever get to get so see her grandbaby and as much as they want to share that with their mom and that is one of the biggest days in a person's life They're, they as a grandparent you even have more of an idea of the preciousness of it all and she didn't get to have that and every birthday she shares, this, this little child shares their birthday with the day grandma was abducted and murdered. I, I, can the jury get over that fact? Well, I think the prosecution in this direct examination, very skillfully done, but right up to the limit, I think, as a trial judge of what I would have permitted. It's not all that relevant that she was having a grandchild born the same day in another state. But that is the theme, or one of the themes for her closing argument in both the innocence and guilt stage and perhaps the death penalty stage. I just want to go back to this prosecutor. I believe her name is Ms. Hicks, Prosecutor Hicks. I thought she did a spectacular Precious. job in her opening statement. And she resisted the temptation that some prosecutors have when they have too much evidence to overplay her hand. I think she's doing very skillfully. Absolutely. All right, folks, you remember him? He presided over the trial of this century. But did you know that Judge Belvin Perry prosecuted another of the most infamous cases in the history of the state of Florida. It all centered on this woman, Judy Buenoano, a.k.a. the Black Widow. In 1984, she was given life in prison in, uh, for drowning her partially paralyzed son, Michael, on a canoeing trip. She also received 12 years in prison after being found guilty of trying to kill her boyfriend with a car bomb. The next year... She was sentenced to death for poisoning another husband, James Goodyear, with arsenic in 1971. She never admitted any of those killings. I think it could happen to anybody. You have to prove that you are not guilty. 
This was in the drowning. I know this lady, and I know how she is with her children. You'll never convince me that she murdered one of her children. I would have found myself guilty if I had heard what was going on. Tomorrow, exclusively on Closing Arguments, the man who prosecuted that case and oversaw the Casey Anthony trial, Judge Belvin Perry, joins us right here on Closing Arguments. I'm a Winter Park resident, and um, uh, my, my nanny is missing. A 911 call signals the first sign of trouble. Jennifer Fulford, a nanny who's been working at this upscale Winter Park, Florida home, failed to pick up one of the children she was caring for. Her employer, a single father who's relied on Jennifer for the past six years, is worried and reports her missing. This is what's unusual, is her purse is here. Okay. Her car's gone, her purse is here, and nobody's heard anything from her since 11. The call sets off a desperate search and a plea on Facebook for information from Jennifer's husband. Jennifer was excited for an upcoming trip to Dallas to meet her grandchild, who was born earlier that day. Surveillance video captured Jennifer leaving this dentist's office the morning she disappeared. It would be the last image of her alive. Three days later, police recovered Jennifer's body from this wooded area. Investigators say she had been stabbed and suffocated, her wrists and ankles bound, her face covered with duct tape. Police quickly tracked down her alleged killer after he withdrew $300 from Jennifer's bank account using her ATM card. So you know, you have the right to be inside, you understand that? Scott Edward Nelson was arrested and questioned by detectives. And I did what I had to do to survive. Nelson would make several incriminating statements and offered some insight into why he may have made Jennifer Fulford his target. I wasn't particularly uh, happy with this. Sure. See, these, these people in, in uh, Winter Park, for instance, right, they have everything but <laughs> They have beautiful homes and beautiful yeah. cars and golf courses. Now walking down the street while all these rich people are walking around buying jewelry and they're having their good life and all this stuff and wouldn't give a rat's about me. At the time of the murder, Nelson was homeless and an ex-convict. Among other crimes, he had served time in federal prison for bank robbery. Now, Scott Nelson faces kidnapping and first-degree murder, charges that could mean the death penalty if he's convicted. Scott Nelson is facing the death penalty, and when he was first arrested, uh, he was arrested in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, this case is being heard in Orlando because prosecutors say the murder happened right there in central Florida. She was abducted from Winter Park. She was found close to Apopka, all in that Orlando, central Florida area. But then the defendant was arrested in Jacksonville. After he was arrested, he was interrogated, and then that interrogation stopped. And then he went into the uh, Federal Department of Corrections down in Miami. And while he's down there, he sends a letter to the investigators up in Orlando, who then head down and record an interview with Scott Nelson. And you heard a little piece of it uh, uh, coming in to this segment, but now you're gonna hear a little bit more as Scott Nelson speaks with investigators about what may very well be the reason he did what he's accused of doing. You know, they call me Brian. I, I appreciate that, Brian. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to uh, put this in the right context for I'll tell you right now. No, I don't want to see that happen. I, I know exactly. 
Pipes. Okay. Okay. So uh, it was the first time I had been to Winter Park. Okay. And um, what happened there was uh, I noticed that um, it's a very affluent yeah. type of, of it place. Is. Yeah. It is. Well, people have a lot of money in bikes like this, and they, they have a different lifestyle. We're 15 minutes away in Orlando, where I was living. People are dead. And there, he's talking a lot about himself. But one thing he did talk about was the folks in Winter Park, Florida. For those of you not familiar with Central Florida, Winter Park, very lovely community. A lot of old money, new money, beautiful homes uh, down there in Central Florida, close to Orlando, to downtown Orlando. It's where Rollins College is. And was the motive here jealousy? They've got it. I didn't get it. I'm going to get it from them, and then I'm going to kill them afterwards how is that going to play with the jury let me bring back in my think tank I, you know i don't think that plays well with the jury i'm just a, a spitballing out here but there's like this is ridiculous it's all about him 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 yeah as pointed out this is his day the yeah. spotlight he's one of society's losers he flat out is whether it's his fault or because his mommy and daddy didn't love him enough but he's done the majority of his adult life has been in federal prison for two extremely serious charges the kidnapping of his father and an armed robbery with explosives and look at him complaining about the medical care this insufficient medical care that he received in federal prison which is actually usually pretty good they do a pretty good job compared to most of the states and what he said was interesting they wouldn't reconnect my colonoscopy he had a colon very serious operation but you can survive with the bag in other words the clutch bag the prison shipped him out they said we're not paying for that Here's some medicine, here's some generics, get out on the street, take care of yourself. He's a convicted felon, he can't find housing. So instead of trying to make his life better, he finds someone to take it out on. In, in any way, does this give the jury a reason to not give him the death penalty? No. <laughs> no. I didn't think so either. But it is his story and he loves telling it. It is, and he, he loves telling it. He needs people to tell. He, Like I said, he's gotten the spotlight. Um, it would not shock me at all if he had some type of manifesto somewhere about the haves or the have-nots. Um, he went from, he got what he wanted, which is he wanted the attention. He wasn't getting attention in prison. He wasn't getting attention while he was free. He wasn't getting attention. All these, all these people are rich and using their money let me get some attention and that's what that's what's happening with that being said he's going to continue to try to get attention and be be ready for the antics during trial uh mark o'mara is with us at the courthouse down in uh, orlando and mark the fact that he's targeting people specifically because they have all this stuff you know they have nice homes they have cars they have golf courses and i and they don't care about me so i'm going to go out and target them that's a real problem uh, for the defense here? It's a horrible problem because it comes across as sort of sociopathy and nobody likes people who hate people. And that's part of what the defense has to deal with. But I will take issue on something that was said about, you know, what are you going to do about something like this guy when he says what he says? Look, again, looking at it as the uh, eternal death penalty optimist, whenever you hear a fact or see a piece of evidence, how do, you, 
how do you fit that into a defense? How do you fit that into a mitigation of the facts or of the person to avoid death? And if the defense can craft together, cobble together from these, these facts, from the way he presents, from the wink maybe, from this really egocentric kind of behavior, if you could suggest to the jury that these are examples and outcroppings of a true mental illness, that you can really say, this isn't his fault. You know, we don't have it down to this point yet, but look, this gene is turned off and it should be turned on in the rest of us. Or, or this type of problem happened with him at an early age, and this is the way it showed with non-social uh, behavior. And if you can try and craft that to a jury to say, look, the reason why he hates Winter Park people is here's an explanation. Here's a psychiatrist, a psychologist who can come in and tell you this is why this guy is acting this way. It's not really all his fault. And that's the essence of mitigation, mental health mitigation. And if you're going to get it, you got to take all those factoids out there and try and come up with something cohesive. Yeah. The other part, though, that I, that I think is everything that I've heard, everything he's written does not make this guy likable. And to me, that's another hurdle for the defense. Like, can you explain that he's unlikable because of, of what's going on upstairs or not going on well, upstairs? A lot of times people with mental illnesses are very difficult to warm to. But one of the things he did say in that interview is he mentioned a psychological evaluation. He mentioned medication. So again, the defense has to latch onto that, like Mark said, and cobble something together to talk about his mental illness and that being a reason not to kill him. Yeah, and this jury has a very uh, up-close view of this defendant throughout the trial because they are seated kind of right next to the defendant. All right, coming up, we're going to have some more audio from this interrogation. And the question here, right, the, the evidence seemingly is overwhelming during the guilt phase, but they still have to prove it. Then the question is, is this a life worth saving? Do you have any idea why you think you may be here at all? No. No? Okay. okay. Um, well, let's go back a little bit. Um, Sergeant Seapass from Winter Park PD. I'm from Orlando Police Department. Okay, you're here in Jacksonville. Um, were you, you were in Orlando last week? Mm hmm Okay. How long have you been in Orlando for? About four months. Four months? Okay. Um, where did you come from? Where were you before you got to Orlando? Prison. Okay, so you got out of prison, you came right to Orlando? Yes. Were you in prison in Florida or were you in prison somewhere else? Um, somewhere else. Federal. Okay. No, no, sure. Nothing. That's all. What made you come to Orlando? Um, it's just where they assigned me to. Oh, oh, for probation? Yeah. Okay, okay. So you're still, so you're doing some federal probation time? That's correct. Okay, all right. And so you were assigned to Orlando, so you got to Orlando. Which is now in violation. But... Because you're in Jacksonville? Right. Okay. Well, I've uh, been arrested. I still can't get over how comfortable he is in that interrogation room. As you know, he gives an answer, eat a couple more peanuts. By the way, in the beginning of that interview, they were talking about pizza, but they could not provide pizza, so they got him peanuts instead, which is what they had. And he was very, very concerned with that. And I understand homeless people always looking forward to whatever that next meal is, and I understand that part of it but also understand the backdrop for all of what we're talking about here. Anyhow, um, I want to play some more of his interrogation audio because that was the video. That took place first. Then he gets sent down to the Federal Department of Corrections down in Miami, sends a letter up to investigators who come back down to talk to him again. And that, again, is recorded audio of this defendant. And keep in mind, as you listen to all of this and you watch all of this, this is a defendant who has written to a judge saying, I will testify at my trial and I will speak at my penalty phase. Take a listen. My probation officer, I would say predominantly everything that I've done, these charges and everything, is, is really wrapped around this probation department. What was his name? Uh, Julio Dominguez. Dominguez? Julio yes. Dominguez? And Scott Finelli. Scott Finelli. Who's the one you dealt with more? Back to prison. I mean, they, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have certain individuals. Oh, of course, yeah. of course they do. 
who they're going to exile and who they're not. Okay. The U.S. Attorney's Office has a lot to do with this. Sure. They're the ones who tell them, hey, you know, go get that guy, get whatever. Okay, so it's, 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 it's a system. Yeah. Right? And so they, they had the notion that they're not going to, that I'm not to survive. And that, well, that's what they had me, that's what they got. So I, I, I went from being like the golden boy and because of sheer work, I broke my ass for this company. I worked right. hard for this the, company. The, the, uh, how do you say it again? I, I think it's a yo boat. But it's all spelled weird and funny. And yeah, it's supposed to be some Greek letter. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody seems to get it exactly on our Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're working for him now, so you're trying to do right. Yeah, and uh, so he, and I was doing very well. And, um, and uh, I, after months and months of, of walking around the streets with nothing, not, mm -hmm. not even water, yeah. I mean, you know, no, trying to change your cost me. Believe me, the, 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 the anger builds up. Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. They, 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 they let me out of Johnny Poe Correctional Facility in Sanford. They raised me there, and I was released from there on okay. May 18th, and I had to, yeah, I'm walking down the street holding my pants up, no belt. Okay. And, I mean, I, I know I'm going to, see, I, I'm, people look at me now like I'm an insect, okay? Well, you know, law enforcement, everyone looks at me. I hope you, I hope you, you know, I don't look at you like I, I, I believe you, Brian. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to help you people. Right. And anyway, right, so it, it isn't, I don't care if it's capital murder, I don't care if it's life, I, it, it just, it, that's another, for another day. Okay. But the, the bottom line is this, is that my probation department, the feds, they put me in this situation as well as those people, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And I still walk around with a cloth yeah, in the back. because of that. Okay. I know. It, 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 yeah. You have no idea how, how sick and evil that is to do to a man. Given half an hour, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't fathom it because obviously I'm not there, but I can, I, I can definitely say that I would, I, if, if it did happen to me, I would be a very pissed off person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm walking around in the park and uh, all these people, you know, they, they have money, they have beautiful homes, beautiful families, cars, uh, diamond rings, it's like what, eight jewelry stores in sure. one block area. Sure. Um, yeah, they're all know, it, 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 driving the Mercedes and stuff. And, and I wanted to make it an example. Okay. Okay. And see, there's a lot of things that you don't even know about. For instance, like uh, when I was first released from prison, uh -huh. I um, I tried doing the right thing. So he says he did work for a paint company for a while, then something happened. But again, getting back to the people of Winter Park, and they look at me, and they've got their diamond rings and everything else. The absolute irony of this case is the victim, Jennifer Fulford. Who is she? She's someone who would help someone like that. That's who she was. And she happened to be in that home because she was working there. She didn't own this home. She didn't live that kind of life that he seemed to be so jealous of. She is someone who helps other people, who if you asked, hey, you know, could you spare something? She is the one who probably doesn't have as much as the other folks in Winter Park that would spare something. And that's the life that was taken here, folks. And that's, and that's, and that's not going to be lost on this jury, I, I don't think. Let me bring back in my think tank. And um, every, what are you hearing as you listen to this defendant talk? Um, I'm hearing that figuratively and literally his life was crap. Um, he has the colostomy bag. He just came out of prison. Um, prison is a terrible place. And then he comes out and he can't make freedom work. So he has to make an example. So what I figured, I think personally, um, with regards to the jury, that if, if I was going to play, if I was a defense attorney, I may just say, listen, where he doesn't want to go is prison. Why don't you send him back to where he absolutely does not want to go? Death would be easy for him. He gets the notoriety, he gets the Netflix episode, but if you send him back to prison where he hates it, that's a better, that's a better penalty than death with regards to this particular case. What, what are you hearing from this guy? And, and do you hear someone that um, was, was dealt a, a bad hand and maybe deserves some sympathy in some twisted, bizarre way? 
Well, I, honestly, what I hear is a guy who blames everybody for everything. He blames the rich people. He blames his probation officer. He blames the feds. He blames his employer. He, bla he blames everybody. Nothing's his fault. He's a victim of everything. Everybody's done him wrong. Wah, 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 poor me. Now, with that said, as a defense attorney, you have to find the mitigation. You have to find something in there that's mitigated and redeeming about him so you're going to have to to show his t difficult life and all that but he's a very hard person to like yeah he's a absolutely and Mark Amara um, let me ask you if he demands to go on the witness stand and takes the witness stand during the guilt phase or the penalty phase and speaks and does all this blaming everyone else in in the world for what happened here what does the jury do with that They dislike him even more than they already dislike him and that they're going to dislike him by the time the evidence closes. They're not going to like this guy. The only way that you can make this other than a death penalty, and again, death penalty should not happen unless all 12 say yes and the judge says yes. But if you're going to avoid that, you've got to turn even the weeds that this guy has sown in his garden You've got to turn that into something that you could sort of blossom a little bit so that this jury can say, even though we don't like what he did, even if we don't like who he is, the defense team has given us enough of an explanation that we can understand, not forgive, but that we can understand him because that's what you need. You need a little bit of understanding, again, to get that one vote on the jury um, maybe even to get the judge to say that this is not necessarily a death case. And it's not going to come from his mouth. It can only come from an analysis of who he is, even with what he's going to say to further destroy himself, whether it's guilt phase or penalty phase. Sometimes being the worst witness that he can be on the stand can actually turn back and help him in the bizarre world of mitigation. All right, tomorrow, exclusively right here on Closing Arguments, Judge Belvin Perry, who presided over the Casey Anthony trial and prosecuted the black widow, Judy Bueno Ano, joins us live. Belvin Perry, tomorrow night, right here on Closing Arguments. Tomorrow night on Court TV. We are live in Orlando with gavel to gavel coverage of the nanny abduction and murder trial. And joining us exclusively, retired Judge Belvin Perry, who presided over the Casey Anthony trial and served as prosecutor in the Black Widow trial. We're basically using the same playbook. Judge Perry will give us his insight on the death penalty case of Scott Edward Nelson. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan. Tomorrow night, starting at 6 5 Central on the all new Court TV. This is the evil part of it all. Jennifer Lynn Fulford was found brutally killed. Her body was abandoned in the woods. 911, hello. I'm a Winterbrook resident, and my nanny is missing. The car's gone, and nobody's heard anything from her. Scott Edward Nelson remains the person of interest in this homicide investigation. The murder was an especially heinous crime. Prosecutors are seeking the death penalty for Scott Edward Nelson. It was extremely torturous to the victim. There is a mountain of evidence against Nelson. I knew what I was going to do, and I did what I had to do to survive. Why? Why? Why did he go after her? Why did he do it? It's going to be a very dramatic trial because these jurors are being asked to decide the fate of another human being's life. I'm just curious to know where, where this is all headed. Dramatic day inside the courtroom today, day one of this trial, opening statements and then some testimony. Some of the most dramatic coming from Jennifer Fulford's husband. And this was really difficult for him. Imagine what he's, he's been through. And the thing with his testimony is what he did so well for the prosecution and really for his wife, Jennifer, was to allow us to understand that a life was lost here and made that very real inside the courtroom.
Solomon's court of testimony here about the deal will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Sir, please state and spell your first and last name for Madam Corporal. Robert Fulford, R O B E R T F U L F O R D. Thank you. Ms. Hicks. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can you please tell us what your relationship was to Jennifer Fulford? She was my wife. How long had you been married? Seven years. And this might be hard a little bit. If you need to take a break, just let us know. Sure. But we do need to make sure that you can answer the questions loud enough for everybody to hear, okay? Uh, seven years. Okay. In September of 2017, where were you guys living? Uh, in Altamont Springs on Sassafras Avenue. Were you employed at that time? Yes. Where were you employed? Uh, Freeman. What is that? It is a trade show company. And what did you do for that company? Uh, production manager for the graphics department. Were you scheduled to work on September 27th of 2017? Yes. What time did you have to be at work that day? Uh, 7 a.m. And so what time did you and Jennifer get up that morning? She got up a little bit before me. I got up at 5.30. Who left the house first? She left first. Do you know about what time she left? Uh, around 6. Anything out of the ordinary with her when she left that day? No, no. Sir, did you ever see her again after she left your house that morning? I did not. Did you ever hear from her during the day on September 27th? Uh, no, I did not. No phone calls, text messages, anything like that? Uh, no. Was that unusual for the two of you to kind of not communicate during the day? Uh, no, not usually. We were usually both very busy. So it didn't give you any cause for concern that you didn't hear from her throughout the day? No. And did you go to work? Yes. And what time did you work until that evening? Uh, until about 5 p.m. And when you left work, where did you go? I went to uh, uh, a nearby shoe store. I was trying to buy, buy some inserts for a pair of work boots. Okay, and were you able to get what you were looking for at the shoe store? Uh, no, no. So I headed home and I stopped at the CVS and bought some that they had there. Okay, so you left work, you went to the shoe store, you went to CVS, and then did you ultimately make your way home? Yes. Now, when you got home, do you know about what time it was? Uh, after 6, sometime between 6, 6.30. And what did you do when you got home? I uh, turned on the TV, uh, wanted to watch a program that I liked that Jenny didn't like. What show was that? Uh, the Walking Dead. Okay. Now, were you ex what time were you expecting Jennifer to get home? Uh, she'd usually come home on, uh, whenever she took care of Oliver, she would usually come home about 6.30 or, or 7 some nights. It, it depended on how late she had to stay. Okay. It, usually she just <coughs> stayed until Reed came home. Okay. So, um, when was the, how, what was the first thing that kind of uh, gave you some inkling, or, or how did you learn that something might be wrong with Jennifer? Uh, well, the Altamont Springs Police Department came and knocked on the door. And what happened when they arrived? Uh, initially, there was a little bit of confusion. They knocked on the door. They asked me if my name was Reed Berman, and I said no. And, and then they said, well, what is your name? I told them my name was Robert Fulford, and they said, you're the husband of Jennifer. Fulford, correct, and I said yes, and then they said, told me that Reed Berman had reported her missing. Okay. What did you do upon learning that information that your wife might be missing? Uh, I tried to call her. Okay. Any luck contacting her? No. Okay. And how, about how long were the law enforcement officers at your house, the ones that first came from the Altamont Springs Police Department? Uh, 30 minutes. And after they left, were they able to give you very much information about what was going on? No. So after they left, what did you do? Uh, I uh, called her friends. I called her family and tried to see if anybody had heard from her. Okay. Tell us some of the people that you called. I called uh, uh, her sisters. Uh, I called uh, uh, her children, Austin, Hannah. So... You were not Jennifer's first husband, correct? No. And she had children prior to you yes. guys getting together? Yes. How many kids did she have? Two. Where did they live? In uh, Austin and uh, 
in Denton, Texas. And so do both kids live in Texas? Yes. And they're adults? Yes. Do they have children of their own? Uh, Austin, at the time, uh, had one and was expecting one. When was his second baby born? That same day. Austin's child was born on September 27th, 2017? Yes. And when you talked to Austin, had he heard from his mom after his baby was born? No. Sustain the objection to the truth of the matter, sir. Overrule it to the extent it may have an effect on the listener. So all the friends and family that you talked to, had anybody heard from Jennifer since early that morning? Nobody had. Okay. Difficult day for Robert Fulford. I want to bring back in our, our think tank. And one of the things that it's such a contrast between the life of the defendant and the life of Jennifer and Robert. Jennifer and Robert wake up 5 o'clock in the morning, working people. You know, they go out, they contribute to society. Um, they make the world a better place, help others versus this defendant. The world is separated between the givers and the takers. And the taker found a giver. And, and, he, and he mercilessly and brutally killed her. I mean, that's the closing. This is easy. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. I want to say that I think that is a very technically proficient direct examination with a little faux pas about The Walking Dead, but that's part of the facts. It's back and forth. It's a nice rhythm. Look how relaxed this gentleman is until the crucial point of the birth of the, the grandchild. And you will hear that and see that in closing when the prosecution puts a picture of the baby that will never see its grandmother in front of the jury. So they'll tie that all together. Yeah, this, is, this is tough stuff. But I also think that it also sheds a light on what happens after a prisoner is released. Like, he did talk about his two probation officers, that he did have contact with them. Um, he did voice um, his struggles in finding a job and things of that nature. At what point did somebody drop the ball? Did, I mean, did somebody not give him services or, um, or at least say, hey, we have a problem, he's being very aggressive, maybe look into him or let's, let's make him, like, let's, let's give him some, some services or something like that. I think maybe if we look into his history, if we look into his, um, that time from when he was released and when the incident happened, that maybe we'd have been able to see, like, hey, he needed a little bit more than just a colostomy bag. You know, though, I mean, here we have, like you said, two people that are out working from six in the morning till six in, or, in, or seven at night, and he just can't get enough from everybody. I mean, he he just wants this and he wants that. He wants his probation officers to give him. He wants the feds to do this for him. He wants them to drop him off here, take care of this. He, it, like Ray said, there's the givers and the takers. These people are hardworking people who are making an honest living, and here this guy is just can't get enough. He's a victim of of everything and everybody in society. He's just hard to like. And, you know, Mark, when we look back on, on, on who this defendant is, and he has no career other than crime and being in prison. That's been his life for so many years. So there, there's, there's nothing to this guy other than a history of, hey, I, I, I grabbed my father. I wanted him to get $10,000 out of the bank. I got caught doing that, so I did a whole bunch of time. I get out, I go into another bank, uh, threaten to blow it up, I get caught in the parking lot, I do more time, I get out, and now I'm arrested for abducting and murdering uh, an innocent nanny. And the only way you're going to get any level of sympathy is to try to explain away that behavior, try to explain away who he is, where it came from, from child abuse to educational problems to mental health problems, whatever. But I do want to spend a moment on the testimony of Mr. Fulford, the husband. Uh, I, I know uh, Kelly Hicks, she's a great prosecutor, I've had a bunch of cases against her. But, but I would tell you, to mention what the gentleman was just talking about, it, the cadence was okay, but I thought that she missed a lot of opportunities to really get across, this is the one time to do it through the husband, to really get across the emotions of the loss and who she was to him and to everybody else. And I thought, you know, there was opportunities there, not to say that you want to play for the drama, but there was opportunities there. The fact that he might tear up or might cry, fine, and that's expected. Let him do it. Let that play out a little bit. 
um, you know, walk them through that even a little bit slower, how long they knew each other, even what is some of they did. Dare that defense team to object when you're trying to personalize your victim a little bit through the husband, because that has its own blowback. But I thought that she played it almost too clean and didn't get across some of the emotions that you really want that jury to feel what it's like to lose your wife uh, to a violent, heinous act. Yeah, we, we may, if this gets to a penalty phase, though, we may have another opportunity to understand the impact that all this has had on this family, which will be forever. Again, I think the, the, the prosecution, I, I hear what Mark's saying, they don't want to make error that will go to the Court of Appeals or the Florida Supreme Court. It's a fine line in personalizing and getting all of that drama. I think the point was well made and it will be circled back in both closing and if they get to the penalty stage. All right, folks.